How's everyone doing today? Awesome. Uh, we're going to have a fun talk, uh, but I'm going to dive right into the technical. Uh, I just have a lot of slides, and uh, holy shit. <laughs> so this is going to be Clipto. This is a new tool set that I've been working on for writing Windows-based self-encrypting malware. So before I get started, let's uh, define what I mean by self-encrypting malware. I'm referring to malware which relies on cryptographic functions to obfuscate and or secure some portion of the executable code and or a set of instructions within an executable file. Uh, this is mainly to kind of like static analysis. Dynamic analysis is still going to be able to figure out what's going on. So let's set a baseline. What does a normal portable executable file look like? What does an executable look like on Windows? Uh, you have your legacy DOS MZ header. This is just a small program that essentially says, hey, this file doesn't run on this type of system. Goodbye. Um, then you have your portable executable header. This contains a little bit of metadata information about the executable itself. Next, you have your section tables. These are mainly in a way of pointers to different sections. They contain some permission information. And then you have your sections, one after the other. And we're going to be playing with these sections in weird ways. So this is what you would get if you were to dump into IDA and look at sections for a normal binary. You would have your dot text. It's a read execute section. You'd have, you would have your input data and your read only data. And these two are marked as read only. And then you would have data, which is readable and writable. Now let's discuss what a self-encrypting uh, malware might look like. Um, you, you would start by adding a decryption stub as well as an encrypted payload. Oh, jumping ahead of myself. So the decryption stub is going to use attribute constructor, and that allows it to run before main. Essentially, this allows you to set up an environment. Your encrypted payload is what you're actually going to be encrypting. This is, what, this is the executable code. This is the instructions. So with this comes some heuristics. Obviously, you have two new sections that you don't see commonly in a binary. Um, you also have section permissions being readable, writable, and, and executable. This might not be a good thing if you see it in the binary. Um, the contents of the section in a uh, encrypted section are going to be identified as data um, by either Pro or other reverse engineering tools. Um, it, it's going to be high entropy data that, so you can use something like chi-square analysis to say, hey, this crosses some threshold. Probably not a good thing to run on your computer. So this is what you would look it would look like if you dump a compiled binary into IDA Pro when it has these anomalies. Uh, we are specifically focusing on this dot payload. You notice it has readable, writable, executable instructions. Additionally, it's identified mainly as data. If we were to look at the control flow diagrams, apples to apples, one would come out with a nice control flow uh, diagram. The other one would be dumped just as raw hex. Um, I would rather have a good control flow diagram to say this is what is going on. So now that's the baseline. What are we trying to accomplish there? How do we accomplish it? Well, first we need the address of the payload section. We need the size of the payload. We need to create a readable, writable uh, section in our portable executable. <coughs> For this, we first need to create this dot payload section. And we need to use something in our makefile to modify these flags so that it is readable, writable, and executable. 
Next, we need to encrypt this payload. Now we can do this in Python. It's pretty easy. The most difficult part of this entire uh, setup is writing the decryption step. And maybe it was my choice of using the Windows Bcrypt library. Um, if you want to write crypto, don't use Windows Bcrypt. It is a pain. More on that later. So let's start by how do we get the address of our payload section? Well, we can specify a custom link or script, uh, LD, TAC, TAC, for both, and then we just modify what we need. It'll look something like this, and I define two symbols, the start of the payload and the end of the payload. I use start of payload, it goes dot. That dot says, give me the current address. Then I collect everything marked as dot payload section. I align it to a 0x200 offset, and I get the end address. Then I can use the attack T flag in GCC to use our custom Linko script. And this is what allows me to define these symbols, and I can uh, call them in externally. So those, that is what the compiler flags would look like. So now moving on to what do we do inside of our C file? We first need to import these external symbols. Um, we have the start of the payload. We have the end of the payload. We import both of these. We just dereference these since they are actually pointers. Um, this will give warnings in C, but uh, I don't care. You can use a pragma to uh, ignore those warnings. And then it's, uh, it's, simple, it's simple arithmetic. Um, the end address minus the start address, you get size. Next, we need to cre create the readable, writable section in our portable executable file. The easy part is actually setting the writable flags on the payload section. For this, we just use opt copy. Uh, set section flags is an option that we have in this. So what I do is I say uh, set the section flags of the dot payload section to code, data, alloc, contents, and load. This will give me the read, write, and execute permissions that I need inside of my binary. I'm going to copy it from crypto back into crypto. So I don't need a second file. It's done right there statically. But now, how do we actually define this dot payload section? Um, interestingly, functions can be giving these attribute decorators, right? Attribute decorators allow you to say, I want this to be a constructor, I want this to be a destructor, or I want this to be a section. So we want something other than that text. How do we do it? Well, um, I defined a bunch of macros to let me do it really, really quickly. Technically, you say, you want this attribute, the section needs to be dot payload. And then you can just define a bunch of macros and use those. But um, there's a slight problem with data. See, uh, data likes to live in the dot data section. I don't like that. I, I need it to be encrypted as well. There's, there's no point in me writing a reverse shell if they see the string C Windows System 32 or C Windows CMD. That's going to kind of not be good for me. I want that encrypted as well. Luckily, we have stack strings. And I can define a, a, a macro for that. So I just cast the string into a byte array, and now it ends up on stack. So this is what a payload would look like. So I would use the pl underscore int to say this is a payload. It belongs in the payload section. Then I would write whatever code I want inside of my um, inside of my payload. And because I've specified this, it's going to be encrypted. But how do we get it to this encrypted state? Um, on the raw file, we need to find the offset of the payload. We need to find the size of the payload. And then we just need to encrypt it. There's no checksums. There's nothing like that. It's pretty simple. Um, 
So I'm going to use the PE file. Um, this is a module that you can uh, get with Python. I, I'm going to open up the crypto, and I'm going to iterate through all the sections. And as soon as I find a dot payload section, I'm going to say, that's what I need. I need the offset and the size. I can grab those pretty quick. Then I'm going to encrypt it and write it right back to the disk, right where I found it. And for this, it, it's, it's simple. I F seek the uh, section offset. I read in that section. I then I'm going to go ahead and define our AES algorithm, encrypt it, and write it right back to the disk right where I found it. So now we have to start writing our decryption stuff. We have everything set up. Now it's just the fun times, right? The decryption stub is kind of custom in that it actually reaches out to a C2 server to get the AES keys that we need. So the steps that are going to happen is as follows. We're going to retrieve a pointer to the entry and exit point of our dot payload section. We're going to calculate that size. We're going to load an RSA cryptographic provider with a public key. We are going to generate a one-time pad. We're going to encrypt that one-time pad with uh, RSA. Then I'm going to send that all back to the server. The server is, of course, going to have the private keys and be able to decrypt this. Then I'm just going to flat out XOR against an AES key and send it right back to the client. Once the client receives that AES key, I'm going to XOR it against the one-time pad and I'm going to retrieve myself the AES key I need to decrypt that payload. So here's where it gets fun. Given the IV, the AES key, a pointer to the uh, dot payload section, the size of the payload uh, section, decryption is still difficult. Microsoft's bcrypt library is a pain, this type of pain. Let's start by fixing a bug in Windows. Um, so, B, uh, crypt input key info ex2 is a symbol that is documented by Microsoft, but they didn't actually export that symbol, so you can't just call it with their headers. Instead, you have to use load library. And from this, I'm going to import this symbol from crypt. Uh, 32.dll. It, it's your typical process for um, using load library. You're going to define the type and signature of the function. You're going to create that function. You're going to load the Crypt32 library. You're going to find the symbol you need and get that address stored right in place. Now we just need to decode that public key. Uh, the, the public key is stored as a variable in an auto-generated header, along with other information such as the IV. Um, that is what the header would look like. So your private key would be stored in there, auto-generated and compiled right into the binary. The first step is to base64 decode this thing, and that's where I learned something interesting about bcrypt again. Um, the first call is to calculate the length. That's all it does. You need to call every bcrypt function twice. The first one gets length, you allocate the memory, the second call actually does the decryption, or the decode in this case. So to finish loading the RSA uh, provider, we're going to need to declare a handle to an RSA cryptographic provider. We're then going to need to decode the Dell public key into a public key info object. And that's where this symbol comes into play. We kind of need that to load this key and use it. And then we are going to get a handle to our freshly loaded RSA key. At this point, we can generate our one time pad. Now, in the header, I have stored the AES key length. So it can be a 16, 24, or 32 byte long key. So I just open up the algorithm, call bcrypt generate random, 
And then I close that algorithm. Done generating all one time pad. We're going to encrypt this one time pad with RSA. Again, there are two calls. The first call is to calculate the resulting length. The second call is to actually do the decryption. And then the client is going to send the encrypted one time pad to the server. The server is going to receive that one encrypted one time pad. It's going to decrypt that one time pad. It's going to XOR this one time pad against the AES key for decrypting the payload. And I'm going to use this uh, apply one time pad, so it's literally just a loop in an XOR. The server is going to send this enciphered AES key right on back to the client. So Python is nice. You can do it really fast. Uh, the client is going to receive this enciphered AES key. It's going to, again, undo what the server did. That way, you can get the AES key back. And then we are going to acquire a cryptographic handle for AES CFP mode. I picked the cipher feedback mode simply because I could use it as a stream cipher. I didn't need to worry about the size increasing. So I'm going to decode that IV just like such. Uh, this was just basic C4 encoded and stored in the header. I'm going to open a handle to a cryptographic provider as such. Then I'm going to set the AES algorithm to CFP mode. And I'm going to give it the correct key and IV information. At this point, we're ready to rock. Because finally, we can actually decrypt the dot payload section. Um, and I don't need to make two calls in this, because the size of our encrypted payload section does not change. In fact, it stays fairly constant from one to the other. Um, so I take in the pointer, I write right back to that same pointer. Finally, we need to destroy all of the AES keys, the one-time pad, all of that. This makes sure that we can't recover it later. And now it's time for me to tempt the demo gods and see if they love me or hate me. So I'm here in my repository. And I'm going to do make clean. So now I've removed all the old stuff that I had in my old compiled version. And I am going to say this subdirectory is dot forward slash um, payload. Everyone can read that font over, right? right? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. OK. So I have a calc shell code, every a reverse shell, and I have a test socket. I'm going to first start by demoing the reverse shell, right? Now I'm checking uh, Python requirements there, doing all the installation process, and it's time for me to do configurations. So first, I need to enter the IP address for the server. Now, if you're running a server on like an Amazon EC2 instance, you have that IP address. However, for me, I'm going for the nice old classic 127.0.0.1. Loop back address. Port number. This is for the payload. How are we communicating with the payload? For this, I'm going to say 8080. And now we have the control port. This is for you as the attacker to issue commands to your victims. Next, I get to choose a security level. Level 1 is RSA 2048, AES 128. Pretty good. Um, I also have RSA for 4096 and AES 256 because 
why take the chance? So now it's going to generate those AES keys, store them in the header, and be ready to rock and roll. And this might take a hot minute, so oh, there we go. And now I have generated our uh, new payload uh, in the dot for its uh, spin release crypto. However, we do not have a server running yet, so. Now I have the server listening. Let me open up a new shell. And then I'm going to run the payload. I've accepted the victim connection. There was a reverse shell coming through. The real magic behind this is I can have more than one victim. So, there's victim number two. How do we send them the commands? I'm going to run the, com the command control locally. Uh, that is going to be in server source, command and control. And now we have a way of issuing all our victims' commands. So here I am. We have this over here. And I want my target to be both of them. And then my command is going to be DIR. And now both victims have actually received that command. However, that's not good enough. What if I want to target just one of these victims? Well, I can do that. So. First, I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy this command because I'm lazy and it's documented for me. I'm just going to list both of my victims. Now I'm going to say my target is right here. I'm going to target just this guy. And then I am going to issue the command of cd. Dot dot. Two victims connected. Only one victim received that command now. Awesome. This is good times. However, I don't want to be checking this server all of the time just to see what the output is from the console. Instead, I want a way of uh, seeing on this client what is going on. Well, I've actually kind of come up with a way of doing that. I'm going to copy this command right here. Sorry, I know how finicky this uh, command control server can be, so. I am taking my time to play that game. Um, the victim is going to be 127.0.0.1. And then <coughs> 1177 is the port. And then I need to end that and end that. Yeah. So that is the log history from that client specifically. It will work for both clients. However, this is just one payload. 
it's not very flexible if it can only do one payload, right? So let me go ahead and terminate this servo because that's again finicky. And come up into bash CD crypto. Now I'm going to go ahead and make the calculator so, uh, payload. Um, and then I want the release build. Again, it's going to go through this entire process. I'm going to need to set up the uh, server. Uh, 127.0.0.1. I'm going to have to set up my port number to 8080. Oh, wow, I am way ahead of schedule compared to what I thought it was. So, uh, the servo control port is again going to be 31337. And let's keep it simple and just go for security level one. Okay, now I can go ahead and run this, uh, this server. Payload, calc, uh, server, command, control, that pack. Now we can run this. And it's going to open up a calculator for me. But, you know, that is a system call for calculator. That's one thing. Can it run shell code? And the answer to that, as long as the zone alarm doesn't get pissy at me, Actually, let me just turn off that firewall right now. Please don't fucking hack me. <laughs> um, view details. All right, turn this and threat emulation is probably what gets me. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn that back on as soon as I can. <laughs> so. <laughs> Why would I be? I know what I can normally do. <coughs> so I'm going to make clean again. Again, I'm going to have to specify all the uh, important information. And generate new key. At this point, I can run also again. So again, dot forward slash bin release crypto.exe. And this should spawn, spawn a calculator. Oh, a zone alarm still got me. So I've got uh, Let me fix the problem. Uh, 
off. Didn't off. Um, and of course, the demo guards are gonna fawn on me. I've been demoing for probably 20 minutes. <laughs> Give me a calculator. No, I didn't. Okay. Well, apparently it's gonna argue with me. I did have the shell code working. Um, fun times. I can't win every battle. Um, that should update. But yeah. So if I go back and actually take a look at these payloads. Let's start by just looking at the uh, calc payload. Um, server, actually, not even server, let me look at client. Vim main.c. That's the entire payload that we just ran. If we go back and Look at pretty much any of these, they're fairly simple creation constructs. So cd dot dot for server. This is the entirety of that uh, server payload. So it's not hard to get into writing a payload, right? It, the um, the back end, what I've done on the back end, takes care of all of the heavy lifting. Um, we can even come back and look at what that looks like live in Ida Pro, right? So, um, payload. It does have a file in the right directory. So right back to Russia. Notice I didn't use main, the make clean. It's going to ask me if I want to generate new keys. I can just say no. I can do that. And now I have a payload that should be working. Um, oh, will be working. But let's go ahead and dump this into Ida Pro. No. I made that debug. Yes, I did. So this is going to be with debug symbols. Again, it's going to have a couple of problems finding main. In fact, it's not going to like it whatsoever. I'm going to come over to a view. Uh, actually, I'm looking for something. I know what I'm looking for, but uh, we have sub views. I'm going to go to the segments. Here is our payload, we write execute. And this is what it's gonna look like inside. So this is exactly what we were looking at earlier. Even with these instructions, I can almost guarantee you they're not good instructions, but here is the start of that payload. So, um, I think some people would have a problem with that running on their server. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm gonna start taking questions and uh, try to fill some time because I rushed through my talk a little faster than I should have. So yeah, any questions? Yeah. Do you have this on uh, GitHub or anything like that? Oh yeah, I do have this on GitHub actually. Um, I guess I was lying, I, uh, I was one slide from done. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, did you XOR um, when you were getting the key just to make it more complicated? So, 
when I did that, the client had the, the um, one-time pad generated, used RSA to send it to the client or to the server, right? So no one in the middle is seeing that. They don't know where that one-time pad is, right? Well, the one-time pad is the exact same length as the AES key. So in that configuration, as long as your one-time pad and whatever you're trying to hide are the same length, cryptographically speaking, you don't get any benefit from using, say, AES. It's just better to XOR at that point and send back. Mm -hmm. So I just use that one-time pad, send it straight back. Now, obviously, don't repeat your you know, one-time pads all the time. That's going to get you broken, but yeah. So, good question. Yeah. Um, for like detection, does they, does like antivirus hate when you're encrypting it? Um, the antivirus really catches it unless I'm like jamming shell code into it, and then uh, I don't know if it's some function call that the shell code is using that gets it. That is my guess, but normally the antivirus doesn't catch on to it very fast. Now that could be that I've just been deving on this computer and the antivirus is just acting weird, but yeah. Um, it's not, it, it's gonna have some heuristics that are easy to catch up on, right? So if you grab a section that's readable, writable, and executable, that's not good, right? Um, you look into the binary, you see that, what do you think? That's malicious, right? Um, same as if you look inside of that section and it's high entropy data, but it's marked as executable. What are we doing with high entropy data in an executable section? This stuff is normally pretty structured, right? So it's just something to think about in that term. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Any other questions or do you want me to demo something else about it? Um,